Hey everyone, Pastor Scott Clem here. Welcome to Central Baptist Church. We are going to be studying in the book of Luke today. Now, this is part of our Wednesday night series, our Bible study um, for adults, in which we have been going through the book of Daniel. We, we finished that study, and now we are going into the Olivet Discourse. And there's some, some rhyme and some reason for that, of course. Now, you're seeing... The study here looking like, not like it normally is, normally we we're, we're live streaming from church. However, this last Wednesday our, our internet wasn't working so well and our live stream kind of got broken up and so I decided that I was going to go ahead and do a separate video um, and put this out there for your benefit um, because what we're, what we're getting into is some pretty heavy stuff. In fact, um, in the, the message that we're about to go through, the study that we're going to go through now, is really kind of more, um, I guess you could say, more a review um, than anything else. In fact, that's what I'm calling it, the, the Olivet Discourse Introduction Review. Um, and so there'll be some new elements, but really my goal is is to really lay down the foundation. And, and if you haven't watched the first, um, the first study on this, then I would encourage you to go back um, however, this study is going to touch on a lot of the same things, but I'm going to give you some new elements as well. Really, uh, again, what I'm trying to do is build a foundation because the foundation is going to mean everything when we study this. And, and you'll see why here in just a few moments. Uh, we're going to be looking, first of all, in the book of Luke, Luke 21. So if you have your King James Bible, I would encourage you to uh, go ahead and take that. Uh, if, if you're if you're watching this, don't have your Bible handy, then what I'll do is go ahead and throw up some scriptures up on the screen. As you can see here, what you're looking at is Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 side by side. Now I've presented this information to our church, and if you can if you can do that, um, if you're technologically savvy, to go ahead. I just you know took the scriptures and put them in side by side. In, in an Excel program, and that's what you're seeing here, but it will really help you because both Matthew 24, or I shouldn't say both, all of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 record the Olivet Discourse, and this is going to help you when you study this subject. Think of, think of um, this discourse uh, broken up, I guess, into three perspectives. You have, you have Matthew's perspective, you have Mark's perspective, you have Luke's perspective, and they're all not going to see things necessarily the same way. Now, it, it's generally going to be the same thing, but Matthew is going to highlight certain things that, that Mark doesn't, and, and Mark is going to highlight certain things that Luke doesn't, and Luke is going to highlight certain things that neither of the other two do. Um, and, and so anyway, when we take all of these perspectives together, we're going to have a fuller picture of what Jesus is talking about with the Olivet Discourse. We're going to be reading here from Luke's passage uh, tonight, and that is going to be Luke 21. And we're going to start here in verse number one and just read all the way, all the way down. Now, I'll go ahead and scroll this down and so you can kind of follow along. I'm just going to read right off of my computer screen here. It says this, and he looked up and saw the rich man casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth unto, uh, he said, of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all of these have of their abundance cast unto the offerings of God. But she, of her penury, hath cast in all the living that she had. Uh, let's see here. And some of them spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. And he said, as for these things which you behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what, shall, and what sign will there be when these things come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must, come, uh, must, uh, must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, Oops. Uh, and great earthquakes shall be in divers places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, 
and great signs shall there be in the heavens. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and, in the, and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or, uh, nor resist. Oh, good grief. I lost my spot here. Hold on. Where am I at? There we are. Verse 16. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not, uh, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. And your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations and perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall, there, shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with great power and glory, in great glory. And when ye shall, um, oh, let's see, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they, uh, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but... My words shall not pass away. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that the day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son uh, the son of, uh, this before the son of man, and in that day, he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives, and all the people came early in the morning to, uh, to him in the temple, for to hear him. Uh, join me, would you, in a word of prayer, Father? Thanks for this day, and uh, we pray that you guide our study here. Help me to speak the things that you have me to speak to make things clear where they need to be clear. Um, and, and Lord, just give us clarity now as we study these things out. Ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, very good. Well, we're going to do a little bit of review here as we begin talking about um, this passage and how to approach this. Now, this is a this is a portion of Scripture, as far as the Olivet Discourse is concerned, that is, that is um, uh, highly debated. There are lots of different views, and we're going to find out why that is. And so I want to start out just by asking some general questions. Uh, these are kind of the things that we looked at last time. There's the questions are, you know, what is the Olivet Discourse? Who is the audience? And what is it that Christ's audience wanted to know? Now, we want to answer these things because, again, this helps gives us uh, a baseline, a platform from which to study the Scripture so that we're rightly dividing the word of truth. So the first question is this, you know, what is the Olivet Discourse? Now I was asking our church members this. We had 
you know, some back and forth on Wednesday night, and, and it was good. And I was getting some answers for them. And of course, the Olivet Discourse is, is a discourse that is given by Jesus, and it is given on the Mount of Olives. Now, we just read that there in, in Luke's Gospel, that in the daytime he was, he was teaching in the temple, and at night he'd go to the Mount of Olives, and there he teaches disciples some things there. And in this discourse is a response that the Master, the Lord Jesus, is giving to his disciples regarding some of the events and happenings that took place earlier that day, particularly in the temple or in the temple mount. Now, consider the, the historical uh, backdrop. This is important. You know, what, what, for instance, precedes Matthew 24? Well, we know it's Matthew 23. Now, what's going on in Matthew 23? Matthew 23 is an interesting portion of Scripture because we have this, again, this discourse with, with Jesus, only it's the, with the Pharisees. And we have seven woes that are pronounced upon the Pharisees and upon the Jewish people. And, and finally, there's the statement that Jesus makes. He says, you know, behold, your house is left unto you desolate, uh, which is a pretty heavy statement. Now, we talked about that. what that is. What was he saying when he says, you, behold, your house is left unto you desolate? Well, get, put yourself at the scene, right? The house of God, the temple, is is right there as Jesus is addressing these Pharisees. And so, you know, there there is an instance where we could say that he is specifically referring to the temple. Behold, your house, your temple, is left unto you desolate. But it also has a larger connotation in, in that who is he speaking to? Well, he's speaking to the Pharisees. He's speaking, we might say, to the house of Israel the house of Judah. And he is telling them, you know, in, in, in kind of, in you know, tongue-in-cheek, kind of both ways, not only is the temple going to be left unto you desolate, but your house or, or the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel at that time. And I think both of those things are important for us to realize. Uh, I don't have this, but if you, if you know, up in the screen, but if you have your, your Bible, turn, turn over to Luke chapter 19, because this is another thing that's we didn't talk about this last time, but I think it, it adds an, you know, an important detail for us when considering what was Jesus talking about at the Olivet Discourse, all right? Luke 19, we have, uh, what am I want to look at? Luke 19, 41. This is interesting because we're all familiar with the triumphant entry of Christ, right? He rides into, into Jerusalem on a donkey, but notice how Luke's gospel gives this detail to us um, in regards to this event. It says this, And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it. Get this now. Jesus is weeping over the city. What city? The city of Jerusalem, the city that he's riding into. Saying, verse 42, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Boy, you talk about an ominous statement. Now, what is Jesus referring to? He's referring to the calamity that would happen about 40 years later in 70 AD, when in fact, the Jerusalem would be compassed about with armies. There would be massive destruction. There would be starvation like that Israel has never seen before. It, would, it was a calamitous time. And of course, secular historians have written about, um, about those events. Well, here Jesus is prophesying about that very thing. Now, why? Why, did, why does Jesus give this, 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 this ominous prophecy of what is going to happen some 40 years later? Because the Jewish people were rejecting their Messiah. They were rejecting the Son of God. Now, this isn't something that took Jesus by surprise. This is something that was foretold in Scripture. And again, as we think about the historical context of what we're reading, particularly in the Olivet Discourse, and, and the destruction of Jerusalem that historically did happen in 70 AD, one of the things that we should also keep in mind is the prophetic element, namely that 
of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Now, this is one of the reasons that we, we spent so much time in Daniel, uh, particularly when we talked about the 70 weeks prophecy and in, in, in discovering what it was. Now, lots of different views on Daniel's 70th week. I believe it was fulfilled in the past. I believe that it's messianic and not eschatological. In other words, there isn't a future 70th week. Now, I know that some people would take issue with me on that and say there has to be a future 70th week. Regardless of the view, I think what we can all agree on, at least for the purposes of our study, is we recognize that that Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, remember Daniel was in captivity in Babylon. Jerusalem at that time was, was laying in ruins and the temple was destroyed. And Daniel gets this prophecy essentially affirming that the, uh, that the the people of Israel would be regathered back into the land, they would be allowed to go back to Jerusalem, and they would rebuild their temple. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah record those very events where the temple is rebuilt. And Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy then, then goes on and talks about how the Messiah would come, but then we had that left turn, right? It, it talks about how the Messiah was going to be cut off not only that, but it talks about how Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed once again. So, so picture this. Daniel's 70-week prophecy, whether you believe it was fulfilled in the past or whether it's fulfilled in the future, I think what we can all agree on is the prophecy starts with the, uh, is, uh, with um, Jerusalem and the temple in, in desolation and de in destruction. It prophesies its rebuilding and that it ends the same way that it began, in desolation and destruction. And here Jesus comes on the scene, essentially affirming that prophecy to the people of Israel, foreshadowing that their, their own city is going to be uh, compassed about with armies, and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple is an imminent thing. And he, and he affirms that here. Now, there's another piece of this that, that I thought was just fascinating. And I came across this this last week and I thought, Lord, how, how cool is this? And it's just one of those details that just adds to this entire narrative. Uh, let me, let me, um, let me uh, put a portion of scripture up here. Let me throw up here Ezekiel 11, 22 and 23. Now, some people would say, you know, what in the world? does Ezekiel have to do with what Jesus is talking about here and the things that are going on in this narrative? Well, hang, hang with me for a second. Remember, Ezekiel has this crazy vision. Um, he, he has these vision of these creatures called cherubim, and these, these cherubim, you know, are essentially holding up the throne of God. And, and, and uh, Ezekiel is given this wild vision of what we might call the chariot throne of God. It, it, there's like these wheels and it's being upheld by these cherubim. And it's, it's, it's almost as if the throne of God is mobile. And what do we see in Ezekiel's vision in particular? Well, we see, we see God's presence leaving the temple in Jerusalem during that time. Now, this was before the destruction of Babylon that would ensue after that. And so God's presence is, is leaving, the, um, leaving the temple. Um, and, and, and so that's the picture, okay? And this is what we find here then in Ezekiel chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. Notice what it says. Then did the cherubim lift up their wings and the wheels beside them, and the glory of God uh, of the God of Israel was uh, was over them above, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Are you are you you, you picture in this? Okay, so God's glory is coming up out of the temple, and it goes to a mountain on the east side of the city. Well, here's here's something interesting. What what mountain is on the east? side of the city directly uh, next to the Temple Mount. Well, it's none other than the Mount of Olives. Uh, and the Mount of Olives, and again, this is, this is kind of, um, this is from a model there in Jerusalem, but this would have been a, a, a similar view to what the disciples and Jesus would have seen as they were on top of the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives was high. And of course, it overlooked the temple, the Temple Mount, just like you're seeing here. But it was also, uh, you know, so high that you could have just kind of this panoramic view of the city. 
and it was on the east side. It was it was there, so you could see the temple just like this. Now, now isn't this wild to think about this? Uh, back in Ezekiel's day, God was sick of the abominations of Israel. He was so sick of it that he actually left the temple. And where did he go? He went on the on the mountain on the east side of the city, the Mount of Olives. And it's almost as if God is now looking for you know from the outside. Um, you know, in and in, 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 in looking at, you know, what's going on there in Jerusalem, just in disgust. And it's very interesting that in Matthew 23, Jesus pronounced these seven woes and this desolation that's going to be upon their house. And he leaves the Temple Mount and he goes where? He goes to the Mount of Olives there with his disciples as they look down at the temple, you know, from the outside in. And Jesus then is going to tell us in the Olivet Discourse, he is going to talk about the destruction of the temple that's going to come upon them. Isn't that interesting? I just I just love how the how the, the word of God just is is um these details just enrich the story. Anyway, um, I, I wanted to share that with you. All right, so so with that in mind, as far as you know, what is the Olivet Discourse? Well, we talked about the historical backdrop, the the prophetic happenings, and in, in, in all of the background here. And so, you know, the question now is, what is the heart of this discourse, or, 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 or the heart of the discourse rather has to do with what? And that is, it has to do with this very temple that they're looking at. Now, now picture this. As Jesus is giving this discourse, the temple, right, that view or something very similar like it, is right before them. And so it, 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 makes, it makes everything that what Jesus says come alive and more relevant because they're looking at the very temple in which Jesus is going to talk about what's going to happen to it. Now, we discussed last time also, what are the different ways to view this passage? And remember, I shared three different ways, and I want to I wanna go over these briefly here. The one, the one view is preterism. And preterism just simply means that, that everything that Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, all of it happened in the past including Jesus is coming. Now, there's variations of this. There's full preterists that believe that Jesus came in 70 AD, and that's when all of these things happened. And then there's what we might call partial preterists, and, and they don't believe necessarily that Jesus came in 70 AD, or that there is, in fact, a future coming of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in a general sense, preterists believe that what Jesus spoke about all took place in 70 AD. And of course, there is some merit to, to that view. Why is that? Well, as we're going to talk about a little bit more, Jesus is, is talking about certain things that are going to happen to that temple that they were looking at. And so this is the preterist point of view. And then in the opposite side of the spectrum, and you can see that on the screen there, you have futurism. And futurism is just the, the exact opposite of preterism. Futurism contends that all of these things that are written in the Olivet Discourse are going to happen in the future. So way outside of the, the lifetime of, of the audience that Jesus is speaking to, uh, these things are, you know, everything's going to happen in the future, including the destruction of, of the temple um, and the second coming Christ of Christ and the end of the world or the end of the age that we're, we're going to look at a little bit later on. And then you have something called historicism. And historicism uh, recognizes that there are fulfillments both in the past and there are things that are going to happen in the future. And we didn't really address this last time, but I want to pose the question to you now. How is it that we should view the Olivet Discourse. Should we read it through the lens that everything took place in the past, as some people do, as the preterists do, or should we put on the futurist glasses and read the Olivet Discourse and, and surmise that everything that we're reading hasn't taken place yet and is going to take place in the future? Or do we approach things from perhaps the historicist standpoint and recognize that there are certain things that have happened in the past, and there are also things that are going to happen in the future. What should our view be? Well, 
we're going to be approaching or I'm going to be approaching things more from the historicist point of view. But the one thing that I really want to, 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 to I guess, emphasize right here, right now, is that our view shouldn't be controlled by our theology. Our view shouldn't be controlled by our theological lens. All right. Some I, I've heard preachers, you know, who said you should read the Bible dispensationally. Well, sh show me in the Word of God where the Bible says that we should view things dispensationally. Doesn't that's a theological lens, a theological framework that we are imposing upon the text. And so it's my belief, my contention that our view of the Olivet Discourse, and yea, in, 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 in every any passage for that matter should be controlled by the text and the context and the prophetic backdrop, which is why we're spending so much time really drilling this down and making sure that you understand what these things, you know, what is happening in this passage during this time to give you a better understanding of what Jesus means as we dig into this. Now, the next question we have here is, who is the audience? Who is the audience? Now, there are dispensationalists out there or futurists who would say, well, you know, they never talk about, you know, Mark 13 or Luke 21. They always want to talk about Matthew 24 in particular. And they say, well, well, the Olivet Discourse is written to the Jews. This has nothing to do with the church. It's all the Jews. In fact, it's not even relevant to us. And there are many futurists who believe that the church is going to be raptured in a preacher of rapture and that really what Jesus is talking about is, is uh, in reference to the, uh, to the people of Israel in a future final seven years before the second coming of Christ. And so they believe the audience is, is Jews, is, is Israelis. But what does the text tell us, right? Um, the, the assumption that many futurists have is based upon, uh, upon inf inference, right? The idea here that this is written to Jews, um, and they have their reasons. But what does the actual text tell us? Let's, let's take a look at this a little bit more. In fact, I'm going to transition back over to our, um, over to our, there we go, our text. Notice, notice what it says in Mark 13, and... Oh, let's see, Mark 13, verse number three. Notice what it says. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives against the temple. Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled. All right, so what's going on here? Who is the audience? Well, it's very clear that the audience is for of Jesus's disciples. Not only that, but you know, is this a public conversation or is this a private conversation? This is a private conversation between Jesus and four of his followers. Now, it's made public, obviously, for our benefit because we're reading about it now. Now, who were these men? You know, the futurists, the dispensationalists will say, well, these men were Jews. And that just proves that this is written to Jews and it isn't written to the church. Well, hold on just a second we could classify these four men in many different ways. Being Jewish is one of those ways. But that's not the only thing that those men were. Who else were these men? These men were apostles of Christ. These men were disciples. They were, they were amongst his closest followers. They were, they were Christians. Uh, they were believers in the Messiah. And so all of this adds to who the audience is. Who were these men? These were believers. These were followers of Christ. And whatever Jesus is about to tell them is relevant to them. It's relevant to these particular men who are Jewish believers. Again, I, I, I posed the question to our church the other night, just kind of a simple question. It's kind of a no-duh question, but I posed the question, would Jesus' answer... That, that he gives to their question, was his, would his answer be relevant and applicable to them or not? In other words, is what Jesus is about to say not relevant to them? Is, is he speaking to a future generation 2,000 years far removed from their day? Is that what he is speaking to? 
And of course, you know, the answer is no, of course not. He's actually looking these men in the eyeball and he's answering their question. And what he is about to tell them is going to be relevant and applicable to them. And that's an important detail for us to, to uh, realize and to park in the back of our minds as we take a look at this portion of Scripture. All right. Uh, the next question here is, let me, let me get back to the PowerPoint. Um, what, is, what is it that Christ's audience wants to know? Well, again, the, the conversation is preceded by what comment from Jesus? If we were to go back and we were to look at both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we'll see that Jesus, in every single one of those, um, one of those uh, uh, perspectives, those, those narratives, that Jesus says, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down, or, or similar language to that effect. And of course, he's referring to the temple, because the remember, it was this was preceded by a comment from the disciples. They said, look at all these stones, and look how magnificent this building is, and which prompted Jesus to say, there shall not be left one stone upon another. Now, now get this now, because again, kind of knowing the history of the of the temple helps. I mean, the stones that they were looking at were told were huge. I mean, these were these were mod I mean, you know, by any estimate, even in, in today's standards, it's kind of a modern marvel. These these stones were just giant. And Jesus is saying that not stone one not one stone shall be left upon another. So naturally, the disciples, curious about Jesus' state, statement, asked the question when shall these things be? In fact, that is a question that is consistently asked both in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospel. Same question, the very first thing they say is when shall these things be? Now, this is a obvious, a clear reference to the destruction of the temple that was then standing. Jesus is making a remark about that temple. The disciples are asking a question about that temple. When shall these things be? Now, in Matthew's gospel, we have a couple of more questions. You know, I, I asked the question or posed the question to our church, how many questions are being asked? You know, some say that there's two questions. Some say that there's three questions. Some even say that there's four questions being asked. Well, in Matthew's gospel, there are three questions being asked. In Luke's gospel, there are two questions being asked. And in Mark's gospel, there are two questions being asked. And the one question that is consistently asked throughout was that first one, when shall these things be? Matthew asks two more. He says, uh, or, or in Matthew's account, we, we have the questions, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Or we might say the end of the age. The, the word there is aeon. It means the end of the age or the end of, of the world. Now, the last of these two questions here, the way that they are phrased makes it clear that they were linked in the disciples' minds. That is, that they believed that Jesus' coming would mean the end of the age, that these would occur at the same time. So, and, 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 it, and it, you know, it's also linked, we could say, uh, with the destruction of the temple. So, in their mind, from their perspective, it, it kind of put it put it to you like this: they couldn't imagine life existing um, any longer if the temple was destroyed. So, in other words, in their mind, they thought that once the temple is destroyed. That's obviously when Jesus comes, and that's the end of the world. It was one cataclysmic event. Now, now you have to get this. This is really important. Understand the perspective of the disciples. They were thinking this was all going to take place in one cataclysmic event. All right. Now, the other Gospels uh, phrase the second question just a little bit differently, because Matthew says, what shall be the sign of thy coming? But the other Gospels essentially say the second question like this, what shall be the sign when all these things shall come to pass and be fulfilled? Essentially, what they're asking is this, when is the temple going to be destroyed, and what's it going to be like when it happens? And it appears very likely to me that they, again, they were under the impression that the destruction of the temple would be the end of the world. And as such, 
that's when they expected Jesus to return. So, so get this here, because Jesus is going to answer these questions. Jesus is going to tell them about a sign that precedes the destruction of Jerusalem. But he's also going to answer this question about his coming, in which he says there is no sign that precedes his coming. And we'll get to that later on. Now, both preterism and futurism assume that the disciples' questions were valid. That, that is, that the destruction of the temple was equated with the end of the age, and that this prophecy would soon be fulfilled as in preterism or still awaits future fulfillment. Now, now get a hold of this, because this, this is going to help you, particularly as you talk to other people about how they view um, how they view end times events and how they view the Olivet Discourse here. Understand what I'm saying here. Again, few, a preterism and futurism both they assumed that the disciples' questions were valid. In other words, preterism believes that there is going to be one cataclysmic event, but that event, they believe, took place in the past. In other words, they believe that Jesus' coming was a coming in judgment, which resulted in the destruction of the, uh, of the second temple, which was then standing, and that that meant the end of the Jewish age, or the end of the Jewish epoch. And, and, and of course, there's some truth to that, because we know that that, that, that is you know, when ancient Israel was, was no more, and, um, and the Old Covenant was snuffed out completely with its animal sacrifices and, and all of those things. And so preterists affirm the disciples' question. They believe, again, it's all one cataclysmic event, but that it happened generally in the past. Futurism affirms the same thing. They affirm the disciples' question. They believe that it is one cataclysmic event, but that's going to happen in the future. In other words, that Jesus' second coming is going to result in the destruction of a rebuilt third temple, and that the end of the world, or the end of the age, is in the future. So they believe the exact same thing, only just in the opposite side of the spectrum. They believe it's one cataclysmic event. By the way, again, this is why there are many dispensationalists and futurists who really get excited and scour the news headlines, and boy, whenever there's anything about talk about a rebuilt temple, they get all sorts of excited. Why do they get excited? Because for a dispensationalist or a futurist, you have to have a rebuilt third temple so that it can be destroyed. So Jesus, you know, uh, the, the end of the world will come and, and he brings in his millennial kingdom and all, and all of these things. And so this really excites them. Um, so, so understand this. Now, I believe that the key is recognizing that what the disciples thought to be one cataclysmic event might, in fact, be two events. In other words, that Jesus' answer that he is about to give is best understood not as, as these events either take place in the past or take place in the future, but rather it's a, it's a, it's a both and or an and both. In other words, that Jesus is talking about events that took place both in the past and take place in the future. In other words, that this passage here refers to both the destruction of the temple that was then standing, that they were all looking at on the Mount of Olives, and it's talking about future judgment, i.e. the return of Christ that does bring about the end of this present age. I believe it's talking about uh, two things. In other words, let me put it this way, that the passage is not exclusively talking about fulfilled judgment on Israel in 70 AD, nor is the passage exclusively referring to future events at Christ's coming but instead is referring to both, that there are in fact two events, not one. This is what I believe Jesus is trying to clear up. Amongst the other things that he says, he's trying to clear up their misconception. In other words, there's going to be two events, not one. 
One event would be the destruction of the second temple then standing in 70 AD. It would be preceded by a sign, namely the abomination of desolation or when Jerusalem was compassed with armies. But then he also talks about event number two, Jesus' second coming and the end of the age. And that event, he, he describes, is not being preceded by any kind of sign at all. That is a, as a day that, that no man knows the day or the hour. And so get this now, because in light of this, we have this tension between the suddenness of of, of coming judgment upon the temple and Christ's coming at the end of the age. Now, this is exactly what, uh, what makes this passage so difficult for people to interpret and process. This is exactly why there's so many different views on this passage, right? Was Jesus speaking about events that would take place in the disciples' lifetime? The answer is obviously yes. He's speaking to four of his disciples who were who had a, a curious question, and Jesus responds to them, and he's going to tell them about things that happen in their lifetime. Okay, but was Jesus speaking about about events around his second coming in the distant future, outside of the disciples' lifetime? And again, I believe the answer is yes. Now let's take a look at a couple of passages here. Luke twenty one. Uh, let me throw back up the um, uh, the screen here. All right, Luke 21. Let's take a look at Luke 21, verse number 20. Let me scroll down here. Come on. All right, Luke 21, 20. Notice, notice what the Bible says here. Jesus says this. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies... Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. All right, question here. Time out. Let's examine the text. When Jesus says, and when ye shall see Jerusalem come past with armies. Who is the ye? Well, we know who the ye is. It's a ye or you, right? We know who's, who's, who's the you he's talking to. He's talking to these four disciples. He's saying, fellas, when you see Jerusalem come past with armies, you know that the desolation is nigh. All right, that's pretty clear. So again, we know that these things are referring to things that happened in the past. All right, but let's look at another same, same, same passage, Luke chapter 20. Let's look at verse number 27. This thing is what I want. All right, scroll past there. All right, Luke, Luke 21, 27. Notice, notice what this passage says. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power in great glory. All right, time out again. Who is the they? Why didn't, why didn't Jesus just use the same language that he used before? When he, why didn't he say, and when you see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power in great glory? What well, seems to indicate here that the they... Is, is talking about somebody else. He's not just talking to the disciples now. He's talking about a future generation. Uh, and so, again, you get the idea here. I liked how, how one author put this. Let me transition uh, this back over, put this quote up here for you. One author, a guy named Kim Riddlebarger, put it like this. He said this. It is this imminent future tension within the text itself that forces us to deal with two critical questions. How much of the Olivet Discourse was fulfilled by the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Preterist view, and how many of these events will be fulfilled in the future, the Futurist view? And the, one, uh, the, the way one answers these questions is the source of the Preterist futurist debate. Again, you can see now why, you know, when we look at this 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 spectrum here, why there's answers all over the map on this particular uh, passage. Now, on top of that, let me add one more element that I didn't talk about last time. On top of that is the idea that dual fulfillments may also be in view here. Um, with, with the events of 70 AD serving as shadows of a universal and final uh, cataclysm at the end of the age. This is why 
A man named Charles Cranfield cautions that, quote, neither an exclusively historic or, you know, things that happened in the past, nor an exclusively eschatological interpretation, things that happen in the future, is satisfactory. We must allow for a double reference, for a mingling of historical and eschatological. Now, what does that mean? Uh, what, what is he trying to get to by that? What is what is this idea of dual fulfillments? All right, again, we're adding another layer here, if it wasn't already complicated enough. All right. So let's take a look at this. Matthew chapter 24, 30, Mark 13, 26, and Luke 21, 7. I'm going to go ahead and put the um, the references up here on the screen again. Let's see. Uh, there it is right there. Matthew 24, 30. Let's take a look at these references because I believe that these references, again, may be, in fact, speaking of dual fulfillments. Now, how so? In other words, a dual fulfillment is something that has a near fulfillment and something that has a far fulfillment. It's something that has, in fact, been fulfilled in the past, but it also foreshadows a greater future fulfillment that will come later on. In Matthew 24, 30, we read this, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, uh, let's look at... Um, Oh, what was the other one that I had here? I got to look. Uh, 26. There we go. Mark 13, 26. And then shall they see this, uh, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Again, and then in, in Luke 21, 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and glory and great glory. Now, a futurist might look at this and say, Pastor, give me a break here. All None of this has happened yet, you know, uh, in the past. These are all obviously future references. Jesus has not appeared in the cloud. Um, he hasn't come with power and great glory. This hasn't happened. All right, hold on just a second here. Let's take you to another portion of Scripture. Let me get the screen switched over here for you. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64. It's up there on the screen for you. This is at Jesus's arraignment, if you will, before the high priest. Remember, you need to put on trial. All right. Jesus says this, then Jesus saith to him, talking to the high priest, thou hast said, remember the high priest is wanting to know. We'll see that more in Mark's uh, passage uh, below that, you know, tell us if you're the Christ or not. Jesus says, thou hast said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. All right, same thing is repeated in uh, Mark 14, 61, 62, but he held his peace and answered nothing. And again, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. All right, who is Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to the high priest. Question, is, is Jesus lying here when he tells the high priest, you're going to see me sitting at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven? When when might have the high priest actually saw Jesus at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven? When did that occur? This is where preterists have the idea here that those verses that we just looked at um, are fulfilled in the past because the preterists will say that that um, this coming in the clouds is a euphemism for a coming in judgment. That in fact, Jerusalem, the, the, the city was destroyed and the temple was destroyed. And that was a reference to Christ's coming. Christ's coming in the clouds is talking about, um, about judgment that came upon the city. And, and is that something that the high priest would have seen? Well, the answer most definitely is yes. It is something he would have seen. So in that sense, many argue that those references in Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a have a fulfillment in that Jesus did come 
and he, he, he visited Jerusalem, um, bringing judgment upon them. All right. But there also seems to be a far fulfillment of these things as well. Maybe a, a fulfillment that is more, uh, that, that is, is, is in a fuller sense. Now, where might we get this? Um, I don't have this on the screen, but if you have your Bible, turn with me over to Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation 1. By the way, this is why people argue about the date of Revelation. Now, preterists, many preterists, will argue that Revelation was written in the 60s, um, you know, there in the first century. Now, why would they argue for an early date? Well, because they say that the book of Revelation is speaking primarily about the destruction of Israel, um, of, of Jerusalem, and the temple that happened in, in 70 AD. But the bulk of academia, the bulk of the evidence, really suggests, and it is my personal view, that Revelation was written in the 90s. It was, it, there was a later date. Um, all the evidence seems to stack up uh, to give it a later date. But you can understand now why people would argue over the date of such things. I mean, notice, notice what Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says. John says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Now, has this happened yet? No. I mean, John John is pretty clear. He cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And not, not just the Jews. It's, it's not going to be an invisible coming. It's not going to be a secret coming. It's not going to be a coming, you know, just just with you know where people see the or the in the end result, which is destruction and chaos and all that kind of stuff. No, it says there that every eye shall see him, and they that pierced him, talking about the Jews, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. In other words, Revelation really gives the indication that this is a future event. And of course, there's some, some similarities there. He comes in the clouds. Every eye shall see him. And so, anyway, the point is this. When we look at, at the Olivet Discourse, there, in fact, may be dual references, dual fulfillments, something that happened both in the past and something that is going to be fulfilled in the future as well. All right. Now, why, why is this important? Um, why why spend so much time laying the groundwork, particularly on how we approach a passage such as this? Well, I believe the the effects, uh, the harmful results are twofold. First, we are deprived of the evidential value and the support of of the faith of those remarkable fulfillments of prophecy which are so clearly presented to us in authentic contemporary histories. In other words, you know, say that's 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 a lot to say there Pastor Clem. But my my point is simply this. One of the harmful results is we don't recognize prophecy that's been fulfilled in the past, something that history very clearly tells us about. And again, this is one of my, I guess, contentions, particularly amongst independent Baptist churches, is you don't hear a lot of people talking about 70 AD and how significant that was, both when it comes to the Bible and when it comes to history as well. I mean, this was a significant, monumental event, and this is what Jesus was talking about. All right, but there's a second, um, a second harmful result, and that is our vision of things to come, i.e. future eschatological events, is greatly obscured and confused by the transference of future predicted events which in fact have already happened and whereof complete records have been preserved for our information. In other words, when we misappropriate a prophecy, when we, when we take something that has been very much fulfilled in the past and then we plug it into something in the future and build doctrines on top of that. What, hap what does that do? That leads to error. That can lead to, to damnable heresies. Let me give you an example of, of one of those things. Let me transfer back over here. And um, you know, we've all heard about um, the Great Tribulation period, right? I mean, every single one of us has heard of something like that. The Great Tribulation. Let me see, find it here. Um, there it is. Matthew chapter 24, 21. Question for you. Is there a period called the Great Tribulation? 
And the answer is no. There is not a period called the Great Tribulation anywhere in the Bible. What happened? Well, they've taken a, pic, uh, a portion of Scripture, Matthew 24, 21, where it says this, And then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now, as we're going to get into this a little bit later on in, in, in future studies, but the idea here is this, is this was fulfilled in the past. This was fulfilled in 70 AD. Indeed, it was great tribulation. In fact, you will find nowhere in the Bible that talks about, quote unquote, the great tribulation tribulation. But here's kind of an interesting tidbit. If you're still over there in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, uh, Pastor Matt First from over in um, in um, Mountain View Baptist Church, Custer, Wyoming, uh, Custer, South Dakota, um, he wrote this in his book, and I thought this was, this was really great. He pointed this out. Revelation 1.9 says this, I, John, who am also your, compa uh, your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, and it goes on from there. So John says, I, John, who am your brother and companion in tribulation. You know the interesting thing? If we were to take a look at the actual Greek there, there is a definite article in front of tribulation. Uh, tribulation is thalipsis. In other words, it's the tribulation. John is saying, I am your brother and companion in the tribulation tribulation. You say, wait a second, Pastor, you're rocking my world here. I thought a tribulation was only seven years and that's future and we weren't going to be a part of it. And here John is saying he is a companion in the tribulation. Again, this is one of the points that I've made and why, why we took a look at Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy and how that was fulfilled in the past and not the future. What did Jesus tell, tell his disciples? What did Jesus tell the church? In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the, uh, overcome the world. Paul, the apostle, tells the Thessalonians who are going through tribulation, he says, remember, you were appointed unto these troubles. You were appointed unto these afflictions. Um, and, and, and here you have John the Revelator who is saying the same thing. He's a companion in tribulation. Folks, the church has gone through tribulation for the last 2,000 years. There isn't a singular period called the tribulation period or the great tribulation period that, that, is, that is sometime yet future. Tribulation goes on today. There are people who suffer great tribulation today. You, you, you say, there is no great tribulation today. Oh, yeah? You, you go and ask, t tell that. Let me propose it to you this way. Tell that to a family who has lost a loved one who, you know, someone who has been martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ, someone who has been in prison, someone who has been beaten, someone who has been tortured, someone who's lost their life on account of their witness and testimony for Jesus Christ. Are you, you're telling me that that person who's lost their life didn't go through, quote, great tribulation? Of course they did. This is what the Bible is talking about. The point here simply is this. Why, why is this harmful? Again, we will misappropriate things that have obviously taken place in the past and we will, um, we will misappropriate those things to something that takes place in the future. Uh, all right, just a little bit more here. Um, this is about where I left off last time with, um, with the church. And, um, I, and I, I'll just breach this, the subject here, try to whet your appetite for things to come. I believe here uh, what happens next. Jesus, is, uh, Jesus gives an answer to these questions. And... Um, what happens here, I believe, is he, he answers, I believe, the questions in order. Now, there's some debate on this. Uh, some people believe that he, he answers the last question first, particularly from Matthew's gospel. You know, what shall be the end of the world? Uh, we had some of this discussion in church the other night, particularly when we look at uh, Matthew 24 and Mark 13, kind of in um, uh, the, um, in the what might I call it the blue and the green sections here. Um, kind of long story short, just to kind of put this in perspective, I believe that Jesus is answering the first question, when shall these things B, in other words, you know, what is, when is the temple going to be destroyed? What's it going to be like? And Jesus is, uh, begins to answer with a general discussion of the time of the end. And when I say the time of the end, I'm not talking about the end of the world, but he's talking of, in particular the end of the temple. Um, and so he gives a general description here. And I believe you find that uh, in Matthew 24, verses 4 through 14. In Mark 13, 5 through 13, 
And then Luke 21, 8 through 19. I believe all of these things are this general discussion of the time of the end. Now, let's just take a look at this. We'll look at um, we'll look at Mark in particular. Let's take a look at Mark and how Mark characterizes this. Uh, let's get up to verse 5. Verse 5 says, And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed, lest any man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when you shall hear, uh, hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must need be, but the end shall not be yet. Again, let me just kind of pause and, and, and put this in perspective again. Who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to his disciples. What he is telling them is relevant to them. He is telling them, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of war, fellas, but don't be troubled. Such things must needs be, but the end is not yet. What is the end? Again, he's talking about the end of the temple, when the temple would be destroyed. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten. And ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my, for my sake, and for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Now, the brother shall betray brother to death, and the father the son, and their children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, and he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Again, Jesus is answering these four men in particular, so what he says is going to be relevant and applicable to them. Now, if that is the case, and I believe that it is, then these things that we just read and what you can read about in Matthew 24, you know, through verse 14 and in Luke 21 through verse 19, that those things would most certainly happen and occur leading up to 70 AD with Jerusalem's destruction. And if that is the case, we should expect to see evidence of their fulfillment, both in the biblical record and in secular history. In other words, Pastor, if what you're telling me is true, if you're saying that those words, because I've always looked at those and I thought all of those things applied to the future end times events, and if you're telling me that Jesus is telling his disciples to look for those things and that those things have occurred in the past, then where is that in the Bible? And where is it in secular history? We should have evidence for it somewhere. And in fact, we do. And that's what we're going to talk about more next time. But there's a, another thing as well, and that is a hermeneutic principle. And that is that these particular verses are going to then have their meaning anchored first and foremost in this historical context. In other words, while there may be some dual fulfillment, and we'll talk about that next time, maybe these things will find some future fulfillment in the last days. Folks, they're anchored first and foremost in that Jesus is telling these disciples what they need to know for that time period. It's something that has already taken place in the past. All right. That's enough for today. I hope I've whet your appetite for what we look at next time because we're going to talk about these very things that Jesus begins to, to warn them about. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these uh, 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 dual fulfillments. And again, I, 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 my, my hope is as we go through this, you'll begin to see with more and more clarity things that in fact have happened in the past and those things that are still left to be had in the future and as we go through this, I hope it'll give you better clarity, of course, on, on, on what's going what's gonna to happen, particularly when it comes to the last days. And then you'll have a reasonable expectation of, of what's to come. All right, thanks for joining us here. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thanks for this day again. Thank you for this time where we could go through these things. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, and I pray that this does whet people's appetite. I pray that this was a challenge. And Father, that we would remember that these things have a historical context, that this audience that Jesus was speaking to was his disciples, and what, what he said was, in fact, relevant to them. 
And so, Father, uh, help us to be open to the things that we find next time in the Bible and in history itself that validates these things. And so we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for being with us again and um, and look forward to future future studies on this very topic. All right. Okay, take care.